Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m. and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord.
Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord.
Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord.
Alright, good evening everybody and welcome to our Saturday 6 p.m. service here in Cathedral of Praise! We welcome all our branches and campuses, even those who are joining us in our online services. Good evening. So now let's all stand up and we will be starting the service with prayer and we will be asking the Lord that God will provide us with godly influences in our lives. So how do we pray, COP? Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today, O oh Lord. And again, Lord, with the hearts of God filled with thanksgiving, we thank you, Father, for we are here once again in your house. We are gathered together in the name of Jesus. And we know, Lord, that your presence is here with us, O oh Lord. We worship you, God, and we praise your name. And we thank you, Father, because we know that you will always provide us, O oh God, with godly relationships. You will guide us, O oh God, and lead us also, Lord, to have godly choices, O oh God, in our friendships, O oh Lord. Thank you so much, O oh God, because you are the one who will always give us the word of the Lord that will renew our mind, that will change the way we think, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Father, because you will be there, Lord, to lead us to this righteous people, to this righteous relationships, O oh God. Even, Lord, our young people as they go back, Lord, to their um, school, O oh God, in this face-to-face -face studies, I pray, O oh God, that you will lead them, Lord, into godly friends, Lord. Godly relationship, O oh Lord. Godly influences. And God, thank you because it is your will for us, O oh God, to have our relationships, O oh God, that are revolving around the word of the Lord that is bounded, O oh God, and founded in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, because it is your will for us, O oh Lord, to have friends that will sharpen us as iron, O oh God. It is you, Lord, who will be there, Lord, to, to just change us, O oh God, as we continue to live in this righteous path. And Father, we pray, O oh Lord, and thank you, because you don't want us, O oh God, to have friends, Lord, that will corrupt this good character that you have planted in our hearts. You want us, O oh God, to live and have good companies, O oh Lord, that will help us, O oh God, and will build us up, that will draw us closer to you, O oh God, that will make us, Lord, worship you more and more and pray to you more and more, O oh Lord. And God, we thank you, Lord, because it is you, O oh Lord, will also help us, O oh God, to say no, O oh God, to wicked people, O oh God, to wicked influences. Father, thank you, because as your word says, O oh Lord, that you want us, O oh God, to live holy lives and, and righteous lives, O oh Lord. Father, we also pray, Lord, that it is you, Lord God, who will help us, O oh Lord, to always, O oh God, surround ourselves, Lord, with godly relationships. And Father, we also pray, Lord, for our um, evangelistic missions, Lord God, locally and internationally. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will continue to give us opportunities, O oh Lord, for the gospel to be preached. God, we pray that it is you, Lord, who will bless us with more workers into the harvest field. We pray, Lord God, for more leaders, Lord God, that will rise up, O oh Lord, and handle more and more Gogum Sword. And even in our branches, we pray, Lord God, for more branches to be open. We pray, Lord God, for more satellites to be open, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that it is you, Lord, who will help us to reach out to those people, Lord, and preach the gospel to them. And God, we pray, Lord, that as people will be part of this Go group, we pray, Lord God, that they will be built up in the faith. We pray, Lord God, that they will mature, Lord God, in their relationship with you. And God, thank you so much that as you provide us, O oh God, with Godly friends, O oh Lord, it is because of your grace, it is because of your mercy, O oh Lord. As you lead us out, Lord, of this wicked people, of this wicked influences, Lord, let your name also be glorified, O oh Lord. And God, we pray that our friendships, O oh God, that our relationships, O oh God, that the people surrounding us, O oh God, will draw us closer to you that will make us better Christians, O oh God, that will make us, O oh God, more on fire for you, Lord, that will make us, O oh God, hunger and thirst for more of you, Lord. Let our friendships, O oh God, be surrounded, Lord, with the word of the Lord, with your presence, O oh God. In, Lord, we pray also that as, as we go, O oh God, our way, we pray, O oh Lord, that our hearts, O oh God, will just be longing for more of you, Lord, and longing for more of your house, Longing for more of your word, O oh Lord. Continue to change us, O oh God. Continue, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Jesus is the light of this world, and the unfolding of his word gives light. Jesus is the Christ. Not a way, a truth, and one way of life. At COP, we know that like the apostles, we are to preach the gospel publicly and from house to house. It is a privilege to be in your homes sharing the gospel. At COP, we know a pastor is to teach the Word of God, enabling us to live lives that please the Lord. At COP, we know we are to preach the gospel to the poor, bringing them to what Jesus called life and life more abundantly. At COP, we heal the sick in Jesus' name, and our God is with us even to the end of the age. At COP, we know that the message is the gospel. We love it, we live it, and we preach it. It is the good news, and it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. At COP, our eyes are on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't worship worship. We don't worship fellowship. We worship Jesus. At COP, we know that we have been called by God to be priests. We are to serve Him. We don't live in our own little world. We serve Him fervently until every lost person is found. We will build 200 churches across our land and across the world in the next 20 years. At COP, we know every member has been given the Great Commission, so we joyfully work while it is yet day, seeing people born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and learning to live for God. At COP, we know that we are to bear fruit and not to gather fruit. There is no shortage of people that need to hear the gospel. Our joy is to go to the harvest field and then bring the harvest field to the Lord. At COP, we know we are to fill His house with His praise. We praise the Lord. We praise Him for who He is and what He does. If it's not about Him, it's not praise. At COP, we know that the tithe is not about obedience to the law. It is before the law, during the law, and even Jesus taught tithing. It is our joy to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse to the Lord. At COP, we know prosperity is about trusting our Heavenly Father for everything we need. No fear of debt, no fear of poverty, no fear of people. Our Father is our provider. At COP, we know that Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. That means that we are part of a great family of God across this world. When one part of that family needs help, it is our role to freely give as we have freely received. At COP, we know God's grace abounds to us, teaching us to say no to sin and to work hard for Him. Say, I.
people for water baptism tonight Yay! and for the first two in main campus. Let's rejoice with Fernando Foronda, Nikki Boris. Now let's go to the South Campus. And here in the South Campus, we'd like to rejoice with Elena Salazar and Rowena Garay. Well, good evening, COP, and welcome to our Saturday evening worship service. What a great opportunity to be in the house of the Lord in all of our campuses, our fruitful branches, and those joining us in our drive-in and online. We thank you for your faithfulness coming to God's house tonight. Now, as we continue our worship service, let me just request everyone, let's keep on wearing our face masks. And, of course, if you have any prayer requests, you have a prayer need, all throughout the praise and worship Feel free to come right here in front in our altars, in all of our campuses, and also in the ground floor there in the main campus. And those in the balcony, just feel free to come into the center aisles. Our pastors and pastoras, they would love to agree with you in prayer. So as our water baptism respondents get ready, let me ask you this question. Are you ready to worship the Lord some more? Yeah. Come on, let's open up our hearts to Jesus and sing to Him. I got a song and I sing it loud. My praise is pouring out. My praise is pouring out. Blessed is you. Faithful in your life, please sing this with us. Here we go. Did he heal you? Yeah. Come on. Yes. Did he free you? Yeah. Yes. Did he save your soul? Yes. Did he make you whole? Yes. yes. Did he wash you? Yes. Transform you? Yes. Did he redeem you? Yes. And then to you? Yes. Yes. Did he set you free? Yes. Give me victory. Yes. When he died for you. Yes. Yeah. With the left and high, yeah. with 
somebody testify. Did it heal you? Yeah. Yes. Did it free you? Yeah. Yes. Did it save your soul? Yes. Did it make you whole? Yes. Yes. Did it wash you? Yes. Transform you? Yeah. Yes. Did it redeem you? Yes. And cleanse you all? Yes. Yes. Did it set you free? Yes. Give you victory? Yes. When he died for you with me yes. on Calvary? We lift them high yes. with all your mind. Yes, yes. We lift the song. Yes. Will you make it loud? Yes. If you got a song, yes. somebody shout it out. I got a song and I'm singing loud. I'm gonna pray this for you.
GOP, has God been good to you? Can I share some good news with you? Brother John called me early this morning. He plans to spend Christmas with us this year. Sis Sister Pat went to heaven, as you know, last year. And uh, Brother John just wants to come over, and he's going to spend the Christmas holidays with us and candlelight communion with us. And so we're excited about that. And please pray for him. He's, his health is doing good. His kidneys are doing good. Uh, my goodness, how old is Brother John now, 88? 86, 87, 80. He's way up there. Okay. Can I give you some more good news? Last week, we dedicated the new church in Romblon. You'll see pictures of it on This Week at COP today. After the service tonight, Pastor Marlon and a team will be going up to dedicate. You're the, Pastor Marlon is the official church building dedicator now, okay? <laughs> They're leaving. They're going to be driving all night. They're going up to Isabella. They'll be dedicating the new church building up in Isabella. And I was so excited this week as I saw... Folks, you got to understand, we have good members in these places. Yes. And they, they, they're not takers, okay? They're, they're good people. Last week, some of the members donated 40 trucks of backfill to fill in the, the parking lot and get it up at the same level as everything else. This morning, I, or this afternoon, I got pictures. One of the members owns a mahogany forest. And so they donated the most beautiful, solid Nara platform. Wow. A hundred, the whole platform is Nara. And so I text Pastor Edrich back and I say, you have the most beautiful platform in all of COP. <laughs> God, just, it's just beautiful. We have good people in these places and they're just very appreciative and very thankful of all that what you have done, all of your sacrifice, and they've joined in that sacrifice. Amen? Amen. They're not takers. They're good people. They're generous people. We can't join hands together yet, but look around at everybody and say, we want to pray together. Just lift your hands before the Lord. Father, we come to you, and we are so grateful that we get to build altars for you in the earth. Father, we're so grateful that we can step in and help not only start these new congregations, but put them in their first buildings. Father, you have been generous to us. You have given abundance unto us. And Father, we thank you because everything we have given, everything we have done has first come from you. Now, Father, as Pastor Edrich and the leaders up there, Pastor Marlon and our team go up as they dedicate that place, let your presence fill that place tomorrow, Lord. Let healing flow. Let the power of the Lord be present to heal. Let the Holy Ghost move and fill people tomorrow, Lord. Let salvations take place, Lord. Let lives be changed and marriages come back together. Father, we didn't build a building. We built an altar for you, an altar of salvation, an altar of healing, an altar of filling. Father, let your presence fill that place in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted. Look around at everybody and say, we're having fun. <laughs> you may be seated. Would you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 5? We have not gotten very far in this. I'm still on the first, the first passage of it all. The first passage of it all. 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6 verse 17. We're learning about how to build a foundation for the hard times. Everybody say, building a foundation. Now it begins, 1 Timothy 6, 17. As for the rich in this present world, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God's. We said the first thing about laying a good foundation for the future, you put your hope in God. Every hope you have, you put it in God. Who richly provides us, so God provides, and God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now we've been focusing on that everything. Everybody say, abundance, that God always gives us more than enough. And we've been learning together the reasons for the abundance, that he always gives us more than enough. There are reasons and there are purposes for all of that. And one of those purposes we closed out with last week was to enjoy. To do what? 
We don't ever need to feel guilty about the blessings God has given us. We don't ever need to feel ashamed about or apologetic about the blessings God has given to our families. As long as those things are gifts of God and they're required with honesty and integrity, we should enjoy them. The only people who need to hide their wealth are people who have gotten it the wrong way. Everybody say, the Gehazis. Gehazis and Judases are the ones that need to hide their wealth. Thieves need to hide the wealth. But people who've been blessed by the Lord, we should enjoy it. And everybody said? Now I want to pick up from there and talk about a few more reasons for this abundance. First one, abundance means you can help other people. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Everybody say help others. The reason we can buy land and build buildings for these other congregations, the reason that we can do aroma, the reasons we can have all the benevolence projects that we have in COP, the reason we can do all of this is because God has given us abundance. God has given us what? Now, now folks, please, if you can't share it, what's the fun of having it? Let me say that one more time. If you can't share it, what's the fun of having it? Now, another one, and you won't like this one, Abundant means that you can loan interest-free to people in need. Now, God has always promised, Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, the Lord will open to you the good treasury, the heavens, to give you rain on your land and season, to bless all the work of your hands, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. But notice how we are to lend to our brothers and sisters in need. Exodus 22, verse 25, if you lend money to any of my people with you who are poor, you shall not be like the money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. Now, beloved, it's one thing to make an investment. Everybody say investments. We're not talking about business investments here. You should always make, an, when, when you make investments, you should always earn money with the money. And everybody said? But, and everybody said? But at the same time, and, and you, you want to be careful because when you loan money to people, there are some people who don't want you to make a profit, and that's not right. They got to make a profit. You should make a profit too. But when it comes to loaning money to a family member, to a friend in need, we don't charge interest to each other in Jesus' name. Business, yes. But when somebody has a need, when families have a need, you don't charge interest to each other. You just loan them money. If somebody needs to borrow money to get their kids in school, if somebody needs to borrow money to, to go buy groceries, you, folks, please, what's the fun of having it if you can't share? So you loan it to them without interest. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, verse 34. And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Now, I want to put a little caveat in here. When you loan money to your family and to your friends in need, you have to understand there are, everybody say, CC, CC, and CCA. What's a CC and a CCA? A Christian crook and a Christian con artist. And every church has Christian crooks, and every church has Christian con artists. And they go from choir to choir borrowing money and never paying it back. They go from go group to go group borrowing money and never pay it back. They go from service to service and campus to campus borrowing money and never pay it back. Please, don't enable those people. Because once they finish with one church, they move on to another church and do the same thing. You have to learn, people have to work in life. I can't hear you. And having a soft heart giving money to people, loaning money to people that have no intention to pay it back, that they just go around borrowing from everybody, you have to learn to say no. Everybody shout, no. Say it again. But when it comes to somebody who has a need, somebody who's just hit a hard spot in life, everybody say, a hand up. Not a hand out, but a hand up. To somebody who just hit a hard spot in life, we should always be open-hearted and lend to them without interest. That's why God gives us an abundance. Another thing, abundance means you can be a good Samaritan. Now, I like what Brother John teaches. You can look up the verses for the sake of time. I won't read them all. But Luke 10, verses 30 to 37, you know the story well of the good Samaritan. Now, the difference, Brother John says, between a good Samaritan and a well-intentioned Samaritan is prosperity. Many times in our lives, we've wanted to help people, 
ngunit walang pera. We've wanted to help people. We have really good intentions, but we have nothing to help people with. You have good intentions. You, have, you are well-intentioned, but you can't help anybody. The reason the Samaritan had bandages that he just traveled with is because he had enough prosperity to be prepared for things. The reason he was able to get the wounded man a ride on a donkey is because he had the prosperity to have a donkey. He could have never helped the guy and gotten him to the inn or to the, what we would call a hotel today if he didn't have the prosperity to have a donkey. The only reason he could bring the guy to the hotel, so to speak, and, and cover his expenses and pay for his food and pay for his room is he had prosperity. And the only reason he could look to the owner of that little hotel and say, now listen, when I come back, if he's needed more, just cover the cost and I'll pay the bill. The reason he could do that is he had prosperity. If he had no prosperity, he would just have a really good intention and a really good desire to help somebody, but he didn't have the money. Having prosperity means you can be a good Samaritan. Now take it a step farther. When we have abundance, there's abundance in God's house. First Chronicles, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 31, beginning with verse 9. King Hezekiah questioned the priests and Levites about the heaps, the piles. Azariah, the chief priest who was of the house of Zadok, answered him. Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we have eaten and had enough and have plenty left over. For the Lord has blessed his people so that we have this large amount left. Why is there prosperity in the house of God? Because God has blessed his people. Why is there prosperity in God's house? Because what? Because the church knows how to do business. No. Why is there prosperity in God's house? Because the church knows how to invest in the stock market. No. Why is there prosperity in God's house? Because the preacher knows how to take five offerings. No. Why is there prosperity in God's house? Because the Lord has blessed his people. Now, I have preached in churches of people I know very well who take five offerings in a service every service. And I've done preach for them more than once, and each time it was five offerings. The second time I preached there, I said, my friend, why do you take five offerings? He said, well, people want to give to different things. I said, well, put different lines on the envelope. Why do you want to take so much time out of a service when you could be teaching the people the word and praying for people and worshiping? Why do you want to take so much time out of a service to do five offerings every service? I said, please, people aren't stupid. They're not going to give anymore. I said, if I was a member of your church, I would look at, at go, okay, he's going to take five offerings today. This is how much money I want to give. And I'd put a certain amount in every one, and I'd give all five, but I'd still give the same amount. Brothers and sisters, churches don't prosper because the pastor stands up and does one-hour offering thoughts. Churches prosper because the people prosper. Did you hear what I just said? And what I teach young pastors is this simple thought. There, there's no shortcut for a congregation prospering. You don't stand up and raise money. You stand up and raise people. You do what? You teach the people the word. You visit the people in their homes. You get them growing and in a vital, beautiful relationship with God. And as they are walking with God and they have faith and they're walking in holiness and sincerity and walking in integrity, God blesses the work of their hands. And then as the people are blessed, what happens to God's house? It has what? Abundance. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 16. O Lord our God, all this abundance we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. Now, I showed you last week the pictures of what we're going to be doing here at main campus with Tower 7 and the complete renovation of the auditorium and the rebuilding of the um, uh, kids' tower. That's going to be the new educational tower. The Bible college and music college and things are going in there. We showed you what we're going to do. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to do pledges for that. But in addition to doing pledges for that, I would like to ask every one of you to look back across the last couple of years because for two years, I haven't challenged you with your offerings. For two years, or two and a half years now, 
We never raised money online. We never did anything like that. But it's time to finish the house of God. I didn't hear you. And God has been good. Has God been good to you? Then I would take a look at how God has blessed your family. And I want you to bring a special offering next week and be prepared as a family. Think about it, pray about it this week, and be prepared as a family to say, this is what we're going to do every week for the next few years to finish and beautify the house of God. All right. Would you put your tithe in the red envelopes, please? Put your seed in the blue envelopes. Up on the balcony, we have the baskets out. On all of our ground floors across the city, come. Bring your tithe and seed before the Lord. Let's all stand up and let's, let's sing this all together. It might get loud. And heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud. Somebody say. It might get loud. Come on, let's all stand up. Heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud. Well, I don't got a halo. But I will be a righteous man. I'm just glad to be a child of God. Hey. Cause when I think of where I could have been, been should have been, would have been, been if we had his blessing. Well, I got a praise on the inside and can't be denied. And I gotta get it out right now. So it might get love. Come on, church.
all of our campuses. Ushers, would you help us please? And let's stretch for the hands towards the ties, the seeds, the vows, all our daily manna bottles, and let us pray. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come again, O Lord, and we are so thankful, Lord, for all the wonderful blessings that you have given us, O God. And now we return the tithe to you, Lord. We saw our seeds fulfill our vows. Thank you, Lord, because truly you richly bless us for our own enjoyment. And not just that, O God, you bless us so that we can be a great help to people, Lord, so that we will never be a borrower but a lender, O God. And especially, Lord, thank you for blessing your people so that there will be abundance in your house. And again, Lord, we pray and thank you, Lord, for building your house, for beautifying your house, O Lord. God, we pray for more seeds to sow and bless all the works of our hands. Receive all these gifts, O God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen and amen. You may all be seated. Let's focus our attention on the screens and let's have this week at COP. This week at COP, would you look at this? A team of COP rangers and ushers went with Pastor Marlon to COP Romblon to help with the official grand opening of our altar for God in the earth. Wow! They spent time in usher training. Brother Noel also joined the team and set up the PA and trained our AMP workers there. COP Romblon held its very first Sunday services in this new facility with 279 total attendees. And we rejoice with the 56 people who gave their lives to the Lord that day. We're very proud of Pastora Sarah and the pioneering team. Then to top it all off, our rangers shared the gospel on the vessel they boarded on the way home, winning another 25 souls to the Lord. This week at COP Batangas, we praise God for 654 souls saved in an outreach at the Batangas City Integrated High School Parents Orientation Program. This happened in two batches. What an open door. Praise God for this. This week at COP, what a great community outreach for District 3. Happening over two nights, the first night saw 131 saved and the second 59 saved for a total of 190. Thanks to our HDC trio singers and also for the workers from District 2 who joined in. The sweet thing about the first night is that when Pastor Amel dismissed the people, they did not want to leave. Until three times she said goodnight, but they sat in their chairs wanting more. After all, who would want to leave the joy-filled presence of God? This week with our mighty men in uniform, thank God for the 22 security personnel at Polytechnic University of the Philippines who gave their lives to God. This week at COP, wow indeed, we had wow God or worship our wonderful God at South Campus and our super wonderful South leaders brought so many people who needed Jesus. Besides an incredible night of worship, we saw 319 souls saved, wow. Our next Wow God You Said It will be at Maine Campus on Wednesday, September 21. This week at COP, we're so thankful for the blessings the Lord keeps pouring into our lives. Some of those blessings were dedicated this week. From the MMU, Police Senior Master Sergeant Wilbert Polig dedicated his house. From our Mission School Group in Baguio, John Lapus dedicated his Toyota Fortuner. From Pampanga, the Manahan family dedicated their own dream home. From COP Romblon, Brother Vic Tobias and family of Maine Campus dedicated to the Lord their VRT Brilliant Hotel. From our River of Life Choir, Jam Libo dedicated his Mitsubishi Montero Sport. Also from ROL Choir, Bea Pena dedicated her red Mitsubishi Mirage. From Santa Rosa, praising God for the dedication of the Bersanillo family, where 30 staff and friends were saved. Coming up at COP, announcing our third Man Up Gathering for 2022. This is going to be a Fathers and Sons edition. The event will be October 29 and will be at South Campus, 7 a.m. till 1 p.m. Great bonding, great fun, great teaching from Pastor Sumrall. For more details, please get in touch with Pastor Marlon. Finally, coming up at COP, did you know? We are now less than 100 days away from our fully booked COP Israel tour for November 2022. Slots are still waiting for you, though, in the prime time February 2023. Have you thought about who you'll go with? 
your usher friends, your choir friends, your go group. Forms are available in any COP concierge. It has been another great week at COP. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. In this series on pushing back, we're getting a little confrontational in the face of culture. It's going to be a short series before we get back into 1 Corinthians, but I wanted to take some time to just push back and say, hey, folks, it's time that the church quits following the world. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, New Living Translation, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So we've been learning together, hey, God never called us to be like the world. We're to be like Christ. And everybody said, God doesn't call us to follow the world in any of their attitudes, in any of their customs, in any of their culture. We don't need to follow the world's customs of music or dress or anything else. And the only way we're going to change is that we let God teach us a new way to think. Everybody say, renew my brain in the Word of God. Now, we've also challenged you from Ephesians 2, and I like the New Living Translation of that one also. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. Who did we obey before salvation? We obeyed him. The spirit at work, the commander of the unseen, the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now, just like God is at work in the hearts of a believer, God is perfecting the good work he began within us. God is always working in our heart to make us more like Jesus. In the same way, the world, Satan is working in the heart of his sons and daughters. Satan is working in their heart to make them more like him. This is why the Bible says evil men wax worse and worse. The world gets worse and worse, and we become more and more like Christ because God is working in our hearts, and Satan is working in the hearts of the devil. So we said, hey, let's, let's break out of this new woke culture today. And so we began to talk about terms like toxic and like canceled, cancel culture and like entitlement. And instead, we began to talk a little bit about adulting. We said that Jesus grew up in a world and overcame all of these temptations and thought patterns that we face today. We said if anybody ever had the right to feel entitled, it was Jesus. We learned that in the temptation, each, each of the three temptations in the wilderness, each one of those addressed in part the concept of entitlement. We saw the life that Jesus chose to live was not a life of entitlement, but he chose to live a life of sacrifice, not selfishness. Now, not a life... Not a life of poverty, but a life of sacrifice. He was very prosperous, but he did not live a life of, of, of selfishness. He lived a life of sacrifice, and he lived a life of servanthood. And he pushed through the toxic environment of his day in order to share the gospel. And we closed out last week with learning how Jesus teaches us these great truths, and we went through some of the parables together and began to understand how Jesus taught the people of his generation about getting over the toxic mentality and getting over the entitlement mentality. Now I want to pick up from there, and we're going to do some more adulting. Everybody say adulting. That, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, that's a term that young people use today about when they have to grow up and act like adults. They say, we're going to do some adulting. Like one of our young pastors recently got married, and they took a video of their very first trip to the grocery store after marriage. And I was laughing with some friends about it. I was telling them about how they had taken a video of their very first trip to the grocery store. I never videoed my first trip to the grocery store. But they took a video of their very first trip to the grocery store. And my friend looked back at me and said, they're practicing adulting. They're practicing what? Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 
Paul said, hey, we were all kids once, and we were all spiritual children once. When we're born again, we are called a babe in Christ Jesus. Paul said, listen, we have all lived there. We have all been there. But there comes a time when you have to grow up physically, and there comes a time when you have to grow up spiritually and do some adulting. So let's put away some childish things today. Look at the person next and say, it's got to be strong again. First of all, the childish idea that you can have a good life and not work. Everybody say, a good life and not work. Now, we closed out our study last week looking at the prodigal son. He was a guy who wanted to have a good life and not work. The only problem with spending and not earning is what? Eventually, you run out. You do what? Now, all over the Christian world today, there is a systematic demonic attempt to destroy the work ethic, not just of all people, but even among the new generation of Christians. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, King James Version. Satan comes to weaken the nations. He comes to do what? Now, if you could get a whole generation to not want to work, if you can get a whole generation to just want to relax and enjoy and have a party, what, what do you do to that nation in that generation? That nation is weakened. That nation is what? So let's do a little adulting for just a few moments. Part of Protestant Christianity is something that is called the Protestant work ethic or the Christian work ethic or the Puritan work ethic. It's a very strong theological principle. It was birthed in the great Methodist revival under Calvin and Wesley. Everybody say, the revival. The revival swept through Western Europe and as the revival swept through, they developed what was called the theology of work. The theology of what? Say it again, please. Now, that theology of work revolutionized places like Germany, places like England, places like Scotland. It revolutionized the economies of those nations because a generation of Christians grew up that knew how to work, and it broke the two-class society of rich and poor. Now, please forgive me. People get mad at me for saying this, but you can study it out in history. There's another force that was released in the world at the same time called Iberian Catholicism. Now, Iberian just means Spanish. Spanish Catholicism, the, the two great colonial powers that were going taking place. One was influenced by the, the revival of Calvinism, the, the great Methodist revival under the Wesleys and Calvin, and the other was a great colonization done by the Spanish colonials. Wherever the Spanish colonials went, wherever Spanish Catholicism went, the Philippines, South America, there's still a strong two-class society, rich and poor. The thing that broke the two-class society in Protestant nations was because there was this theology of work among the people, and people realized that if they would work, God would bless the work of their hands, and they no longer had to live in poverty. Are we still here? Are we still here? And anywhere you go in the world today, where you find Pentecostal churches, where you find strong Protestant churches, you will find in every one of those societies, including South America and the Philippines, you will find there is a strong, growing middle class dominated by Christians. Dominated by what? We are a strong force because there is a theology of work within us. Now, the world comes along and says, you need to learn the four-hour work week. The world comes along and says, you need to succeed in business without really trying. The newest, the newest fad that the world is trying to propagate into, mental, into people's minds is a, is a phrase called quiet quitting. Everybody say, quiet quitting. I think it's had over a million hits on TikTok already. Quiet, everybody say quiet quitting. Quiet quitting is a new doctrine among young people that says, I, I want a paycheck and I'm going to have a job, 
but I'm not going to work very hard. I'm not going to do anything more than I absolutely have to do. I'm going to do just enough to keep my job. Another famous doctrine in the world today, and I've had young people tell this to me. Pastor, your generation lives to work. My generation works just enough to live. I said, well, the only problem with that is you're going to run out, and you're never going to leave an inheritance for the next generation. But you notice how quiet it's in here when you start talking about this stuff? Look at the person next to you and say, relax. It gets worse. Now, we need to get back to a theology of work. Everybody say, a theology of work. Now, let me give you nine very, very quick thoughts. Just nine very quick thoughts on a theology of work. Number one, when God created man, he put him to work. Genesis 2, verse 15. And the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. God did not create us to chill. God did not create us to relax. God did not create us to have a party. God created man and put him to work. And put him to what? Remember, we were created in God's image. God did creation in six days, and then the scripture says on the seventh day, he rested from his labor. We were created in God's image. We are builders. We are workers. We are what? This is the way we have been created. And if you try to function separate from how you're created, you're, you're never going to have a good life. Secondly, the fall of man, sin, made work harder. Genesis 3, beginning with verse 17. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of the which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So again, God created us to work. The fall of man, sin, made work harder. But God didn't say quit. Did you hear what I just said? God did not say quit. God just said it's going to be harder, but you're going to, and you're going to have to work harder. But God didn't say give up and quit. Third thing I want you to see. Skill in work is what brings promotion in life. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Now, now please forgive me, but, but straight up for a minute. It did not say, do you see a man skilled in computer games? He will stand before kings. Young people, please don't get mad at me. Do you see a man skilled in playing? Do you see a man skilled in partying? Please, when I was in, in university, there were guys that we called party animals. These guys were the life of every party. These guys were skilled at partying. But you know, when you look back across life, those guys never amounted to anything. Those guys have lived with nothing all of their lives. Do you see a man skilled in his work? Skilled in his what? He will stand before kings. How many of you want to see promotion in life? Would you raise your hand? Then what do you need to be skilled in? The work that God has given you to do. Let me give you another one. God expects us to find enjoyment in our work. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 25. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. New Living says, and find satisfaction in his work. At some point, young people, you have to realize something has to change in your heart and you begin to enjoy work. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. It was so quiet. Enjoy work. Uh, uh, let me say that one more time. <clears throat> Enjoy work. Find satisfaction in work. Are we still here? Something has, a switch has to change in your heart. And I believe it's a God switch. I, I believe that God gives you enjoyment in your work. 
Now let me just back up here and just throw in another thought for you, right in the middle of all this. Have you ever studied the great empires of the world? Have you ever noticed why empires fall? Now, I haven't studied all of them, but I remember one time doing a real detailed study because I, I read this, I, I looked at, I didn't read the book, but I looked at the, this headline on a book, the title of a book. It said, Why the Roman Empire Fell. I thought, wow, why did the Roman Empire fell? So I remember taking a few months of my life and just really understanding why Rome fell. Rome fell because people wanted to party and not work. They wanted to go to the Colosseum and watch the games and get free food from the emperor and not work. Show me any society where the people are learning to just chill and relax and not work, and I'll show you a, a nation that's crumbling and failing. We need to learn to find enjoyment in our work. <clears throat> I can't hear you. Let me give you another one. Work is how we provide for our needs and help others. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, Paul said, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Now what does Paul say Christians are to do? Do honest work with our own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He said, hey, do honest work with your hands. Not just to provide for your own needs, but so that you have something to share with other people. Now let's talk about quiet quitting. The next thought, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. New Living Translation. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. Working for who? Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. On Monday morning when you go to work, don't look at that boss as if they're your boss. Jesus is your boss. And everything you do, you do it as like you're working for him. You show up on time. You show up early for work because you're working for Jesus. And he will reward you. You give it your best shot all day. No quiet quitting. No just, you know, kind of coasting along, just enough to not get fired. That, n none of that stuff. That's not what a Christian does not quiet quit. A Christian works with all their heart because they know that what they're really doing is working for God and God will reward them. And that their boss is really not their boss, their boss is Jesus. The theology of work, my goodness. The next one, people who do not work should not be allowed to become parasites among those who do work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who walk in idleness. They're not busy at work. They're busy bodies. Have you ever noticed that people who have time to criticize everybody else aren't doing anything in life? Are we still here? People who have the time to stick their nose in everybody else's business and criticize what everybody else is doing, it's because they have nothing to do in life. They're lazy. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. Now notice what Paul says here. We, we should not enable this. Now please, I know I'm going to sound ugly here for a minute, but straight up talk. Parents, you're not helping your children by letting them stay home. They're 32 years old. They graduated from college 10 years ago, and they're still playing video games at home all day. You're not helping your child. You're condemning them to a life of poverty because one day you're going to go to heaven. Every new generation has to learn to work. Now, in COVID, I know we helped out our families. All of us stepped in and all of us were helping out families. But you know, there are some people in the family, 
talagang one tamad. We have families where 13 relatives moved into their house during COVID, and there's one person working. Nobody else wanted to work because he COVID. They quit their jobs because he COVID. So you got one person working in a call center, making 35,000 a month, trying to feed 15 people. Credit cards are maxed out. They're going in debt. They're borrowing from everybody. And still these people don't want to go get a job. I looked at one young person and I said, listen, you can't keep supporting your brother-in-law and sister-in-law and their five children. Why doesn't your brother-in-law go get a job? Why doesn't your sister-in-law go get a job? Why doesn't your sister go get a job? Why doesn't your brother go get a job? Well, Pastor, can see COVID down. Folks, COVID has become an excuse of the lazy. It's time to get to work in Jesus' name. I know this isn't popular, but this will bring blessing to your family. And we cannot continue to enable a new generation to just sit around and be lazy. We have to challenge the new generation to work, to help carry the load. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially the members of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. For a man to stay home and refuse to work because he just doesn't want to work, he doesn't want to feed his family, he doesn't want to help provide for his mom and dad, he doesn't want to help provide for his children, he just wants to stay home while his wife goes to try to work. That man is worse than an unbeliever. Are we still here? Are we still here? Now, these are Paul's words. They're not mine. These are words inspired by the Holy Spirit. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially the members of his own family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, the problem with all of these people who don't want to work is they have the same desires that everybody else does. Proverbs 13, verse 4, the soul of the diligent craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly, su richly supplied. Proverbs 21, verse 25, the desire of the diligent or the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Yes, they have the same desires everybody else has, but they won't work to see it accomplished. Now, brothers and sisters, if you want something, you have to learn to work for it. Everybody shout, if I want something, I have to learn to work for it. All right, look at the person next to you and say, relax. That part's done. Second part. Some more adulting. There's another childish idea we have to deal with. This childish idea says, follow your heart. Everybody say, follow your heart. Please forgive me. That's a big thing in the world today. The world says to follow your heart. But who did I teach you is at work in the hearts of those who disobey God? Ephesians 2.2. Satan. Satan is at work in the heart of those who refuse to obey God. Diba? Ephesians 2.2, New Living Translation. Now, if you're following your heart, and Satan is the one working in your heart, who are you really following? Satan. Who are you following? So forgive me. When the world says, oh, we have to follow our heart, what the devil is really saying is, follow me. Now there has to come a point in our life where we recognize what God says. You don't ever want to follow your heart. Everybody say, never follow my heart. The heart is like a big box. Matthew 13, verses 34 to 35, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good person out of the good treasure brings forth good, and an evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. Matthew 15, 19, out of the, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, ad ibapa. The heart is like a big box. Whatever you put into it is what fills it. 
You say, well, pastor, as a Christian, if I only put good things in it, can I then follow my heart? Still, we don't follow our hearts. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who could understand it? The heart is a very poor source of guidance in our life. We cannot follow our heart. We cannot follow our feelings. Everybody say, my feelings. Say it again. Feelings are fickle. That's another way of saying the heart is deceitful. You have to learn in life, feelings or your heart are something that we just don't follow. Now think of some of the, the things that are in our heart. Matthew 15, verse 12, the Pharisees were offended. They were offended at Jesus. So they followed their heart and they walked away from Jesus. But the Greek word offense has nothing to do with sin. It has strictly to do with opinion. In their opinion, they didn't like what Jesus was saying. They didn't like what Jesus was doing. So in their feelings, they were offended. And they refused to believe and follow Jesus. Now, I can take you every one of these kind of feelings, bitterness, resentment, lust, the desire for other things. We preached about the desire for other things not too long ago. All of these things are feelings. You don't follow your feelings. You don't follow your heart. Say, well, all right, pastor, what do I follow? You follow Jesus. Matthew 4, verse 19, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. But now, Jesus, I, I, I have to walk away from, from my dad who, who's here in this boat. I have to walk away from my family business. Uh, 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 Jesus, uh, uh, we're going to leave our father alone in this boat to, to handle the oh my, my Oh, my heart is torn. Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Don't, don't follow your feelings. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Everybody say, follow Jesus. Matthew 8, 52, and Jesus said to him, follow me, and let the dead bury those, bury their own dead. Oh, Jesus, I can't follow you right now. I can't come with you right now. I have to go bury my relative. No, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Gee, if a preacher were to say that today, it would be headlines. Well, there's no more newspapers. I haven't seen a newspaper since lockdown. It would be headlines on, on Twitter. It would be viral on Twitter. Preacher tells young person to walk away from dead family member and just go into the ministry. Yeah, that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't say follow your feelings. He didn't say follow your grief. He said follow me. Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus passed by in front of them, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Everybody say follow me. But now Jesus, I'm a tax collector. Nobody likes me. I'm the most unpopular man in Israel. And I'm not just a regular tax collector, I'm a chief tax collector. Jesus, I'm considered a Roman collaborator. Nobody likes me. I, people hate me. Jesus, I can't possibly, no, 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 no. Jesus said, don't follow your feelings. Follow me. Matthew 10, verse 38. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And please, I mean, I could just keep reading. I've got another 20 verses listed out here. If anyone serves, John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Who do you follow? So you don't follow your feelings. Look at the person next to you and say, never follow your feelings. Say it again. Your feelings are fickle. The heart is deceitful. Now, again, the world comes to you in this new young generation and tells you, you've got to follow your heart. You've got to follow your... No, you don't follow your feelings. You follow Jesus. Look at the person next to you and say, don't follow your feelings. Follow Jesus. Say it again. i got news for you. You are never going to see the accomplishments in your life if you're going to follow your feelings. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Your cross is, is the will of God for your life. He didn't tell you to take up his cross. He told you to take up your cross. 
and deny yourself. In other words, put down your feelings, put down your desires, put down what you want. God has a better plan for you than you have for yourself. Now whether whatever field of endeavor God has called you to work in, whatever God has called you as a destiny for your life, I promise you it's better than anything you could come up with. But at some point, young people, you've got to stop listening to the world. Well, I just want to follow my feelings. How many mothers are here? Would you raise your hand? All the mothers, raise your hand. How many fathers are here? Raise your hand. Do you remember when your children were about this big? And you went to go to work in the morning. And you have to go to work because you have to earn and feed them and buy formula and buy diapers, all that stuff. Do you know? And you're, you're, you're getting ready to go to work. And as you get ready to walk out the door, your little one grabs a hold of your leg. Daddy, mommy, don't leave me. Do you remember those days? Did you want to leave? No. My feelings stay, stay home and take care of my little one. But if you stay home and take care of your little one, forgive me, you have no food to put into their mouth. So you had to tell yourself, I can't follow my feelings. I have to do what's right for my family. I have to go to work in Jesus' name. Are we still here? Some of you in COVID, forgive me, fear gripped your heart, especially in those early days of COVID. I watched young people go to work there was no work for home for a lot of the young people and the young professionals in those early days. And they'd get out and they'd get on the back of a motorcycle because there was no jeepneys working, there was nothing. And they'd go to work. They'd face COVID every day. But they had to go to work. Feelings, they were afraid. But they didn't follow their feelings. They thought, you know what, I've got I to gotta earn, I've got to bring home food for mom and dad and my brothers and my sisters in Jesus' name. At some point... You tell your feelings to shut up, and you do what's right in Jesus' name. Are we still here? Do you want more? You want some more? Another childish idea that we need, need to want, do some adulting on. I want an easy life. That's a big deal now. It's a big deal. People, I just want an easy life. The world says you should never have any stress or pressure in your life. The world says you should never take any risk. There should be no stress. There should be no pressure in your life. If something makes you, pressure, makes you feel pressured, quit your job. Well, okay, how are you going to eat? Do you remember how we closed out last week? Iron sharpens iron. Marshmallows do not sharpen iron. Cotton balls do not sharpen iron. Four-inch Uratex foam does not sharpen iron. Iron sharpens... I, I didn't hear you. There's going to be some pressure on your life. There's going to be some stress in your life. You're never going to get ahead. You're never going to move your life forward living in isolation trying to escape pressure. You're never going to move ahead with your life living in an echo chamber of Facebook where you want everybody to agree with you and everybody to be nice to you. I'm sorry. It, it doesn't work like that. Everybody say, it doesn't work like that. I, I didn't hear you. I remember going into one of our church members' business. It was a, a casa for cars. And there was this client that was just really, really ugly ahead of me. Just, they were ugly. I mean, they were like, they were nasty. And finally the guy left. And I walked up to our member and I said, boy, you're, you're very patient. I said, boy, that, that guy was really nasty and really rude and really disrespectful to you. He said, that's all right, Pastor. I'm going to make 100,000 pesos profit off him. I sat back and laughed so hard, I think I disturbed everybody in the shop. I said, you've got your eye on the goal, don't you? He said, yeah. I've got tuition fees to pay for my kids. I know that guy's nasty, but he pays well. Mm. 
Everybody say, he pays well. Now, now some of you young people, forgive me, you have a boss that's more like a demon. But the pay is good. And you're putting food on the table. Are we still here? At some point, you've got to be willing to go through some stress. You've got to be willing to go through some pressure. Now think with me of the Apostle Paul for a minute. Just, just think of Paul for just a minute. Think of all the things that Paul went through. Did he ever run away? When he was stoned and left for dead, did he run away? No, he got back and walked right back into the same city, Diva. Walk, walked right back through the city gates again, right past the guys that stoned him and left him for dead. Think of all the hardships that Paul faced in his life, but he never backed down. He never quit. He never said, oh, I would just like to have a break. I'd just like to have an easy life. He never did that. Not once ever. You think about the great church that Paul built in Ephesus. Really, at that point, the greatest church in the world. The center of Christianity had moved from Jerusalem and now had moved actually to Istanbul, to the Ephesus area. The great revival that had swept, Acts 18, Acts 19, swept all of what was then called Asia so that every Jew and every Greek had heard the gospel. The seven churches of Asia were started. I mean, it was a, it was a revolutionary move of God. Now, what did it take for Paul to build that great church? 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Paul said, what do I gain, humanly speaking? I fought the wild beast at Ephesus. New Living says, what value was there in fighting the wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there was no resurrection? Everybody say, wild beast people. Now, have you ever thought about that for a minute? The wild beasts of Ephesus. Have you ever tried to sit down and logic with a wild beast. A rhinoceros is charging you. A rhinoceros won't sit down and have a conversation with you. There's no, there's no logic there. A lion or a tiger, when it wants to kill you, is not going to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and let's talk about this and let's come to an agreement about this. A wild beast is just destructive and vicious and wants to destroy you and kill you. Paul said, that's what the people of Ephesus were like when I showed up. He said, and I fought with those wild beasts. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, again, regarding Ephesus, he said, a wide, effectual, a wide door of effectual work was opened to me, and there were many adversaries, new living, although many opposed me. Paul was never a man who would quit. Now, young people, think of our Savior. Think of all the opposition he went through. Even to do something as simple as to heal a person, he had to fight with people who didn't want him to heal on the Sabbath. Walking through a grain field, he had to fight with people on the other side for criticizing his, his disciples for just pulling some grain off on their hands and eating it as they walked through the grain field. Think of all that Jesus went through. Think of all of his suffering on the cross. Did he quit because things got a little hard? Did he quit because there was a little bit of pressure? Did he look around and say, I don't want any more stress. I'm going to give up and quit? Now, young people, please. The world wants to make you a bunch of quitters. Satan wants to weaken the nations. The world wants to make you a bunch of quitters. But we are not quitters. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. I didn't hear you. Look at the person next to you and shout, I am not a quitter. Shout it again. There's so many people when things get a little hard. Oh, Kawawa, I want to run home. Mommy, mommy. It's time to grow up. It's time to face some stress. It's time to face some pressure in Jesus' name. It's time to get better. Iron sharpens iron. Going through hard times makes you a stronger, better, more capable person in Jesus' name. So we have to keep moving. We have to overcome this, this culture of lethargy, this culture of laziness, this culture of, oh, I just want to have an easy life. I'm sorry. 
That is not what life is going to be like. When we get to heaven, we can relax for the rest of eternity. We cease from our labor in heaven. But on earth, we work. In heaven, it's going to be all good times. On earth, we have to face some hard times. But God is with us. Now think again. Oh, there's so much I can teach you on this. Think of all the scriptures. Just, I, I got another, what, one, two, three pages of verses I could sit here and read you. I won't read them all for the sake of time. But think of all the verses starting in Deuteronomy 11 and going all the way through Ephesians chapter 6 where God says, be strong. Everybody say, be strong. And I won't read you all the verses. Be strong. Joshua takes over, be strong. David tells Solomon when he takes over, be strong. Every time you find, I mean, just go through and pull the phrase out of your Bible. Be, everybody shout, be strong. He never said be weak. He never said be a quitter. He never said fade when there's a little bit of pressure or stress on your life. He always says, be what? Say it again. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Be what? I, I didn't hear you. I looked at a young married man, among uh, 28, 29 years old, one baby at home. And he came to me and said, Pastor, I'm going to quit my job. I said, why? You just got a promotion. He said, yeah, and with my promotion, I got this boss that is the nastiest human being I ever met. Comes from another nation. Pastor, he is, he is the most unreasonable, nasty. He yells at me every day, curses at me, swears at me, uses the F-bomb all day long at me. He said, I'm going to quit. I said, all right, let's talk about this for a minute. I said, do you have another job? He said, no. I said, so let's say you quit. How much money do you have in the bank? Not very much, Pastor. We haven't been married very long. I said, how much does formula cost a week? He said, I hadn't thought about that. I said, how much is the rent? How much is your monthly budget? How long before you have nothing for your wife? And your new baby? I said, young man, it doesn't matter what that guy says. You look past him and remember your wife and your child in Jesus' name. You can put up with an idiot to feed your child. You notice how quiet it is in here? Everybody say, I can put up with an idiot to feed my child. Three months later, he came to see me, big smile on his face, ear-to-ear -ear grin. I said, why are you so happy? He said, Pastor, I put up with him. I said, that's good. He said, and Pastor, he just got fired. And Pastor, I just got promoted into his job. I said, yeah. You work as if you are working for the Lord. He is your true boss. He will reward you. Now, young people, I know I've been strong last week, and I know I've been strong again this week. But young people, if Jesus tarries, you've got a life to live. And you can't run away every time things get a little hard. You can't be a quitter. You're going to have to learn to face the stress. You're going to have to learn to face the problems. You're going to have to learn to put up with the ugly bosses. You're going to have to remember you're working as unto the Lord. Amen. I didn't hear you. Yes. And it's amazing if you keep your eye on your goal. It is amazing how God will reward you. Would you stand with me, please? Everybody say, we're learning some adulting. Say it again. Look at each other and shout, be strong. Shout it again. Shout it again. Beloved, you are not weak. 
God lives in you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You say, Pastor, is it ever wrong to quit your job? Or is it ever okay to quit your job? If you got another job, remember, feed the family. I, I can't hear you. Would you take your communion, please? Now, I want you to think with me. When Jesus hung on that cross, just, just think with me for a moment. Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Think with me about some of the statements that our Savior made. In the garden, he said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. As he cried out and sweat great drops of blood, he wasn't following his heart. He wasn't following his feelings. He was following the will of the Father. When he hung on that cross, think with me. He didn't say, I I'm done. I'm finished with this. I'm going to get off this thing right now. Forget it. I'm finished. It hurts too bad. He stayed there. Now, just think through the example of our Savior. When you're making decisions about life, think through the example that our Savior lived in front of us. And make a decision, be strong in Jesus' name. Everybody shout, be strong. Be strong. If life gets a little hard, it's okay. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Opposition gets a little tougher, it's, it's okay. Iron sharpens iron. I'll come out of this better and stronger in Jesus' name. Ulita yeah. Natan, this bread, this bread represents, represents the body of my Savior. I remember what he did for me. The example of his life. He didn't follow his feelings. He did the will of the Father. He did the work of the Father. And he never quit because he loved me. Because he loved the family of God. I'm going to follow the example of my Savior. He built a future for me because of what he did on the cross. I will build a future for my family by doing the will of God in my life and never quitting. Let us partake of the bread together. Ulitanatan, this cup represents his blood. Washed away all my failures, all my shame, all my guilt from all my life. His blood brought me near to the Father. His blood sealed the new covenant for me with the Father. I remember what the blood of Jesus has done for me. Let us partake of the cup together. There's a little verse in the book of Job, and I don't normally like the book of Job. I, I, I'm just being honest. With you. Job's always been hard for me. But as I've been reading it this year in my devotions, there's verses that have just jumped out at me. And one of those verses is, the mouth is for tasting food, and the ears are for testing words. Everybody say, testing words. Testing words. When you hear these modern philosophies... When you hear quiet quitting, becoming 
the new viral thought pattern in your generation. Step back and go, what does the Word of God say? What does God say? How did my Savior teach me to live? If you want to get ahead in life, follow Jesus. Uh, I didn't hear you. Look at the person next to you. Just follow him. Follow his pattern. Follow his teaching. Follow what he has laid down for your life. Quit, quit following the customs and patterns of this world. Follow Jesus. Now, young people, I know last week and this week, I've really been tough dealing with this woke culture. And I know I've really been strong. But young people, I wouldn't do anything in the universe to hurt you. But I want you to be successful. I want you to be successful spiritually. I want you to have a great walk with God. If Jesus tarries, forgive me, I want to play with your kids just like I used to play with you when you were young. I want to see a whole new generation rise up. I'll never forget one of our members came to see me. She and her husband, they, they, they were not big fancy people. They were just simple people. But I taught them on how God had a promise to give them a house and lot. And they sacrificed and they bought their house and lot. And it's been quite a few years now. And they said, Pastor, we just had somebody offer us 9 million pesos for our house and lot. Pastor, we only paid like 650000 for it. But it's been quite a few years now. They said, Pastor, do you realize that we are the richest person that has ever existed in our family? And I remember walking away smiling and going, Lord, they just followed your word. And look at what you did. They, they didn't go to all the fancy places to eat. They had to make their house payments. But now all of their relatives who went and ate at all the nice restaurants and did all the fancy things and had all the latest gadgets, they have nothing. And this couple is very prosperous. They lived the word. Prosperity is not about sowing the seed and getting money back in your hand. Prosperity is about living the life that God has called you to live. Are we still here? And sometimes that means stuff like today. So young people, please, if I messed up your brain a little bit, got you a little irritated, that's good. I got you thinking. But now go back and search the scriptures to see if these things be so. And if I taught you the word, live the word in Jesus' name. Don't live the culture. Live the word. Well, you know, Pastor Samuel, your generation. Excuse me, my generation? Excuse me? I'm not that old. Be merciful. Young people, it doesn't matter about the generation. It matters what the Word says. If you live the Word, God will bless you. So go back and search the Scriptures. These things be so. Live the Word in Jesus' name. Campus pastors, would you come, please? Amen. So before we close, uh, I would like to invite some of you. Maybe it's your first time or you've been coming here for, for quite some time right now. But right now, you just want to move up and want to grow in your walk with God. It's time for you to be involved and be part of this local church. You believe that God is calling you to be a part of this local church. We have a beautiful Livingstone Center in front, in the front lobby. Our ushers will be there to help you and guide you. And we will answer your questions, and we want to be a blessing for you. Amen? Let's all pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that you've given us. And thank you, Lord God, for your word, O oh God. It's indeed very relevant to our lives, O oh God, even in this generation. And Lord, we thank you. For Lord, it's time for us, O oh God, to move up, O oh God. To be, Lord, to grow in our Christian walk, O oh God. And even in our, Lord, in our work, O oh God, Lord, thank you. For, Lord, you indeed, O oh God, walk, wake us up, O oh God, tonight, O oh God, and cause us, O oh God, to really work hard in our lives, O oh God. We thank you so much, God, for your word, O oh God, is so rich, O oh God. And even, Lord, work ethics, O oh God, we can learn from your word. 
We thank you, God, for we will leave this place applying what we learned tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you again next week.